want you to notice a phrase that is an interesting phrase. And we'll look at it a little bit more in detail tonight. But the Bible says, I prayed for thee. Jesus speaking here uh, to Peter. He refer references him as Simon. Simon, his name before. Uh, he called him apart unto himself. He says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And then these two words, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. In the moments preceding the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to Peter in Luke chapter 22 and verses 31 and 32, the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Uh, this repetition of his name emphasizes the seriousness of Jesus' voice as he focuses his attention on, on Simon Peter. He says to Simon, he says, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, they may sift you as we. He says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. This warning to Peter uh, came right after the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper had taken place. They were in the upper room, and they're coming to the closing hours of our Savior's life. Uh, in just a few a few moments, a few short hours, uh, he'll be um, uh, betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And uh, the kiss of betrayal, he'll walk down uh, to um, the Sanhedrin Hall and, and uh, he'll be uh, beaten beyond recognition and cat of nine tails, and of course, across at Golgotha's Hill and, and their uh, place within uh, that, uh, that hole that had been prepared for our Savior. The warning that we have here that was given to Peter, if you notice, it's interesting. Uh, sometimes you don't see this, um, but uh, it's there. The Greek word translated there, you, Satan hath desired to have you, uh, is not in the singular tense, it's in the plural tense. And so God is, Satan is saying, or God's saying to Peter concerning Satan's desire to have you, it's not just you and you alone, Peter, that Satan wants. Uh, he wants all of the twelve. Uh, he wants all of the inner circle, he wants all the disciples of, of Christ uh, to be sifted as wheat. It's his desire. So it's in the plural form when we see the word you. And while Jesus was addressing Peter, his reference to the desires of Satan applied to all of the apostles. But you notice when he says, by I prayed for thee, thee now becomes that singular part to where Satan desires all of us, but Peter, I want you to know in particular that I've prayed for you. Satan wanted to sift them like we. A phrase that is referred to the practice of tossing the grain to separate the wheat kernels from the chaff. Uh, basically, he wanted to throw them around and make them, Satan wanted to throw them around and make them spiritually unstable. The Bible says an unstable man. I know my man is unstable in all of his ways. So he wanted to leave him in a place of instability. Satan wanted to hurl everything he had at these, these apostles to detour them from the great mission that they would soon undergo in taking the gospel to the world. Uh, these were the few that would be scattered abroad. And we're a byproduct today of the faithful testimony of these uh, faithful men of God that began to spread and propagate the gospel around the world. You see, Satan knew how much damage these men of faith could do to destroy his evil works. See, there's the works of God and there's the works of the devil. There's the, the kingdom of righteousness and the kingdom of darkness. And, and uh, Satan knew that these men of faith and men of God could really uh, cause harm to his evil kingdom. And, and he also knew how many souls they could take from him and bring to Christ through the word of God. He understood their potential impact of all those that belonged to him as a child of the devil, and once he accepted Christ, they were no longer, as you and I have accepted Christ, no longer a child of the devil. And so Satan wanted to wear them out physically, emotionally, mentally, so that they would surrender spiritually. And Satan does the same thing for each of us today. He wants to wear us out physically, emotionally, mentally, so that we'll resolve to the fact that it's not worth it. I'm just going to give up and we surrender spiritually. And so interesting, Jesus did not say in this verse, I've mentioned it many times, Jesus did not say, I pray that Satan would leave you alone. That's what I thought I would pray. 
if I knew Satan was after me or my children or, or one of you as a church family member, I, I would hope that I would pray, Satan, God, please keep Satan away from them. And, uh, but Jesus did not pray that Satan would be uh, kept from them, nor did he pray for Satan to keep his hands off of them. Uh, he didn't say that. We would probably pray that uh, in regards to loved ones and family members. But instead, uh, we see interesting here that Jesus told Peter they prayed this prayer. He says, I'm praying this prayer, that your faith doesn't fail, that your faith fails not. That was his prayer. Not that you'll avoid the hardship, but that the hardship will not cause your faith to fail. Not that you'll avoid the hard situation and circumstance you'll have to go through, but that that situation and circumstance won't cause your faith, your trust, your dependence upon God to fail. In saying that, the Lord was clearly indicating that it would be Peter's faith that would ultimately overcome the satanic attacks that would come against him. Because God knew that uh, Satan was after his faith but God also knew that it was the faith of Peter that would stay strong, that would overcome the attacks of the adversary, the devil, to try to dis discourage him or sift him as the Bible references at wheat. Now, we usually don't understand maybe the, uh, the sifting process of wheat uh, that would have been in the first century uh, fashion, but there's a more familiar visual that maybe demonstrates uh, the same point. Uh, as Christmas comes, you'll uh, go into the stores and, and you'll see these Christmas globes. And uh, you maybe even have some at home. Uh, in that Christmas globe, I remember as a kid and uh, my grandmother got me one, just a little small one. And, and it had maybe a, a Christmas tree in there and Santa Claus was in there. And, uh, but you would shake that thing and all the little snowflakes and, and stuff that was in there, it was so calm prior to the shaking. And once the shaking took place, then all of those uh, those, those white specks and the white snow and all that stuff would be just jumbled about, ramming into each other and, and um, uh, uh, banging into each other inside the globe. Those little pieces uh, of uh, snow inside would fly in the air, collide with each other, and, uh, and, and land there somewhere eventually. Uh, only time would tell. But it would look like utter chaos. Complete chaos there. And that's the way sometimes life leaves us feeling, doesn't it? It seems like sometimes uh, through the physical attacks and the, the emotional attacks and the mental attacks, uh, Satan is sifting us as weed and trying to shake us and, and to leave us in a position where uh, there's chaos and uncertainty and instability and it just shakes and shakes and it seems like there's no rest and calmness. Uh, in the, the life, in the heart of a child of God. And that's what he was trying to do to the apostles. That's what he was trying to do to Peter in this situation. Uh, and uh, we see in this side that life does get mixed up. Life does become confusing. Life does become chaotic. And our minds often become very jumbled because of that spiritual attack emotionally, mentally, and physically that bombards us from all avenues to cause us to uh, surrender spiritually. That's all the devil desires. He wants us to surrender spiritually and say, you know what, I'm not going to keep doing what, what I've been raised to do. I'm not going to keep doing what God's called me to do. I'm not going to keep uh, holding the ground that I've fought for for all these years. I'm going to surrender the ground. And many, many Christians, many better than us, uh, over the course of life and the course of time, some that we've even worked and served alongside of uh, have come to the place to where bombarded physically and mentally and emotionally, they just surrendered spiritually. And they just felt as though it just doesn't pay to keep on fighting and standing and, and, and going forward against the tide. That it's just a little bit more difficult than they can handle. And so this sifting of wheat, as we look at the story, Satan aims to sift Peter like wheat, and Jesus, and Jesus also uh, aims to keep Simon's faith, he says, through the prayer from falling. So we can conclude then that the sifting like wheat, and Jesus' response that he's going to pray that his faith fails not, that this shaking process, sole purpose, is a cause us to shake our faith. Because he says, I'm going to pray that your faith doesn't fail because of the sifting or the shaking or the, the turmoil or the agitation that's going to come into your life. The sifting of Simon Peter is Satan's effort to destroy his faith. And this is Satan's tool today as he tries to destroy our faith. It's relatively unimportant to Satan what it takes to destroy our faith. It doesn't matter to him uh, whether it's wealth or poverty 
uh, whether it's a popularity or loneliness or despair or discouragement, it doesn't matter what, it's, what, what Satan must uh, utilize. All he desires is to sift our faith. If he can do it by suffering, he'll try that. If he can do it by wealth, he'll try that. Uh, if he can do it by uh, wrong friends, he'll, he'll try that. Uh, if he can do it by uh, multiple things, he'll do whatever he can uh, to try to sift it. So the statement that is given to Peter by Jesus in Luke chapter 22, 32 is very interesting because it says now, verse 32, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And then he says, and when thou art converted, strengthen Thy brethren. Tonight I want you to listen on purpose as uh, we dissect this story and see what God truly is wanting to teach us tonight. The verse gets our attention because typically the word converted is reference to salvation. You had so many converts today. You had so many people saved. They accepted Christ as their Savior. And so conversion or uh, converted uh, is often used as a salvation. In fact, nine times the word converted is used in the Bible. Seven of those nine times, it's in reference to salvation. But two of those nine times that converted is used in the Bible, it does not reference salvation, one of them being here tonight. When we talk about a convert, we're talking about someone that's received Christ as their Savior. But here Jesus is not talking about Peter being uncon being converted as, a, as salvation is concerned. He's talking about conversion as a change. When you, when you go into, um, when we started the, the church, we uh, met in a conference room and uh, the bed was, was a, a folding bed that went up in the wall there at La Quinta Motor Inn. And uh, the bed would go up in the wall, and they had the TV there and the, the desk there. And, and so we would go into that room every Sunday morning, and we would convert it uh, to be a church. And we'd turn the TV around, or we'd put something over the TV, and, and we'd set up chairs there. And we would uh, put up uh, little displays that would make it seem like it was a church. And so we would convert it. Uh, we would change it from its original intent, which was a motel room, and we would change it or convert it. Uh, into a church. We did that over on Prosperity. We did that at a house we bought in Golden Valley. We did that on um, uh, Freeport, the industrial a warehouse. And uh, it's used now for uh, storage of electrical stuff and things. And, but at that time we had converted just to open warehouse space. We changed it. We converted it uh, to a church. And so when we talk about the word conversion here, we're converted. Uh, we're talking about God referencing when thou art Converted when you're changed, but not just changed. We're talking about a changing of Peter's mind, a changing of Peter's mind. In the story, Peter's declared to the Lord that he would die for him. You saw it in verse 33. He says, said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And so he said, I'm willing to die for you, and I'm willing to die with you. Peter was very outspoken concerning his devotion and love and commitment and dedication to God. He was very outspoken about that. Uh, he was uh, unashamed to tell others, uh, whether it was done in pride uh, or just uh, pride to be identified with Christ. Uh, we don't know, but I'm sure his heart was sincere and intent, uh, and he loved God very, very sincerely. God had made a difference in his life, but he was outspoken with his love and devotion to God. But he's not aware. Peter is not aware until Jesus brings it to his attention that Satan desires to have him. That's, that's a scary thought. Uh, it's good to know that Satan's bothered by your way of living. It's good to know that you've caught Satan's attention because you're trying to make an impact against his kingdom for the kingdom of God. Uh, but when God tells him, Peter, I have no idea. He says, I'm going to die for you. I'll go to prison for you. Whatever it takes. I'm, your, I'm with you, God, and with you, Jesus. I, I won't let you down. I won't forsake you. And uh, Jesus reminded him and said, well, wait a minute. Hold it. Satan has desired to have thee. They may sift thee as wheat. Jesus is warning Peter to not be too confident in himself. He's warning Peter of the danger of thinking too highly of his devotion and dedication 
to following him. It wasn't very long until we see Peter under the pressure of the enemy denying the Savior three times. But thankfully, we see Peter overcoming this failure in his life, but not until after the damage had been done. I've entitled the message tonight, Living to Avoid the When. Living to Avoid the When. The Bible says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when. Living to avoid the when. Let me make some foundational observations. Number one, Peter's mind was already made up. Peter's mind was set. He'd already decided what he was going to do. He'd already decided what direction he was going to go. It didn't matter what Jesus said. Peter's mind was set. His mind was so set that we see Peter disagreeing with Jesus concerning the advice that Jesus was giving Peter. And it's not a good position when you find yourself disagreeing with God. Peter was doing just that. And it's just as dangerous for you and I reading the Word of God and choosing to live another way. You know what God says to do, you know how God says to live but you choose to live other than the way God has chosen you to live. So Peter, his mind was made up. He already decided in his mind what he would do. Christ himself could not change his mind. Second statement is this. Peter was very confident or overly confident concerning his love for the Savior. It's a good thing to have a love for God. It's a good thing to be committed to God. It's a good thing to be devoted to God. Uh, he had an over, though, confidence concerning this love for his Savior. We know the story. Jesus and the disciples are gathered together to celebrate the Passover meal. Jesus predicts that that very night all the disciples will fall away and, on account of him. And Peter protests and says, I'll never fall away. Peter says, I'll, I'll never forsake you. Peter says, I'll, I'll never do that. I'll die for you. I'll go to prison for you. I'll never do that. Jesus was trying to give instruction. Jesus was trying to give uh, warning. Jesus was trying to give advice. But Peter had his mind set up. And Peter was already overly confident concerning his love for the Savior. And so Peter believed that he never betrayed the Lord. And he trusted his flesh rather than listening to what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Look in verses 33 and 34. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter... The cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Your mind's made up. I want you to know the choice that you're making with this mind made up is going to cause you to betray me. It's going to cause you to deny me. The rooster's going to crow. And when the attacks came, we know the story. Peter denied as the Lord had said. And just as Peter was making the third denial, the rooster crowed. And probably the most Sad verse, one of the most sad verses in the Bible is recorded for us in verse 61. Same chapter, but look in verse 61 of Luke chapter uh, tw uh, 22 that we're in here. Uh, the Bible says, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. What a look. What a look, huh? Peter had already said, I won't do it. I'll go to jail with you. I'll, I'll die for you. The rooster had crowed that third time. The Bible says the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. God had instructed him some things, but his mind was already made up. How he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. The Bible says after he betrayed and denied the Savior, he made eye contact with the Savior. He remembered what the Savior had said. The Savior had said, this is what I want you to do. And he says, oh, I, I'll die for you. I'll go to jail for you. But he was reminded at that moment when the rooster crowed, the contact was made with his eyes, and he went out and wept bitterly. We can only imagine the extreme remorse and shame Peter must have felt. He had failed the Lord. He had also failed himself. He wept because he realized he was not strong as he thought he was. He wept because he was not as strong as his mind had told him he was. 
He was convinced in his mind that he knew more than God. He was convinced in his mind that he knew better than God. And God says, you better be careful, Peter. Can you imagine what Peter must have felt every time he heard a rooster crow from then on out? Can you imagine every morning when the rooster would crow, a constant reminder of that event that took place in his life, a, a constant reminder of what Jesus has said, of what he chose to do in spite of what Jesus said, and the rooster crowed as a constant reminder of that crossroad in his life that he chose to do his way instead of God's way. He was the one who said he would be with Jesus in the end. But now he's reminded every morning when he hears the rooster waking up, the sleeping town, how deeply he disappointed the Lord. I said, number one, Peter's mind was set. I said, number two, he was overly confident concerning his love for the Savior. Number three, Peter realized his need for dependency upon God and not to depend upon his, his flesh or himself. That was a lesson that he learned. He learned that he could not depend on the flesh, but he had to depend upon the Lord. Then here's a message tonight. Here's a message tonight. Peter did fall, but he was converted. He did fall, but praise the Lord, he was converted. God used him in a great way after that. God empowered him again after that. God enabled him to be a tool in the hands of God in a very special way. As you read through the stories and Pentecost and, and other things as you read through the book of, of Acts, Peter did fall, but he was converted. What do you mean, preacher, he was converted? He didn't get saved again, but he did have a changed mind. His mind did change at that time. And he did do what Jesus said to do. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And when you read the books of First and Second Peter, I want you in your personal Bible studies to remind yourself that First and Second Peter are nothing more than Peter doing what Jesus said to do when he was converted, when he finally got his mind changed. I want you to strengthen your brethren. And First and Second Peter were written in obedience to this failing, but this change of mind that caused him to look at life, look at God from a different perspective. And as you read First and Second Peter, you see a man that's writing it with a transformed, changed mind perspective that he had to learn as he went through this falling in his life. First Peter 5:10. Let's look at these few verses here. Go to First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10. All through the book of First and Second Peter, we see a man that was converted, a man whose mind was changed. First Peter chapter five and verse 10. We see here that uh, he was converted and he understood the importance of depending upon God and not upon the flesh. He understood the importance of following God's guidance and leadership rather than his own mindset and determination and, and the overconfidence he had in his love and devotion to God. And we see in 1 Peter 5.10, but the God of all grace, he says, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Listen, he said, I've had to suffer. I've had to bear the load that uh, maybe I would not have had to have bared uh, born had I followed the right course and not had my mind set. I want you to know, I want you to teach you something. I want to strengthen those that remain. I want to strengthen those that, that they'll learn from the mistakes I've made. That you'll trust God. You won't depend on the flesh. You will rely upon God and First and Second Peter is a continual uh, uh, exhortation of Peter doing exactly what Jesus told him to do in regards to telling and strengthening the brethren. Go to Second Peter chapter one and verse number twelve. 
2 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 12, he says, Wherefore, I'll not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in what? In the present truth. He says, I want you to be grounded. I want you to be established. I want you to be rooted in what? Truth. I want you to know what truth is. I want you to know what right is. I want you to do what God says. I want you to follow God's plan. Be grounded, because the price you'll pay, the cost that's owed, is far greater than you'll ever understand. Strengthen Peter when you're converted, when your mind's changed. Then I want you to, to strengthen your brethren. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5, just back a page from 2 Peter 1. Peter learned a great lesson that night. Some 30 years later, he wrote this in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. He said, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, oh, it takes on a whole new meaning. When Satan came to him and said, Satan had desired to have yet. They may sift you as we. Oh, listen, I'm better than them. Satan won't get me, God. I mean, I'll follow you to death. I'll follow the prison. But 30 years later, a lesson that is learned that's passed on to the brethren there to encourage them and strengthen the brethren. Uh, there he said, listen, the devil is a roaring lion, seeketh who he may devour. What's he say? Whom resist? Stead fast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplishing your brethren. They're in the worst. And listen, you've got to resist the devil. How? I pray that your faith fail not. You've got to resist him with your faith. And Satan's desire is to sift us. And the sifting is to cause us to surrender our faith, to give up our faith, to quit trusting God, to think we know better than God. And he said, listen, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to resist and be steadfast in the faith, knowing that the adversary of the devil walked about. So these verses, as you read First and Second Peter, will take on a whole different dimension when you realize it's him following through on and when thou art converted. Strengthen thy brethren living to avoid the when in your life. You say, preacher, isn't it great that God used him after that? Failing in his life, I said, praise the Lord, it is. It's exciting. It's wonderful. And we can be a testimony in so many different areas of our life where we have failed. And we've dropped the ball. And uh, we've uh, disappointed ourselves. And we, yes, we've disappointed God. And God has, has rebuilt and restored and re-strengthened. He's done all of those things. That's what God does. And that's what God specializes in. But listen, I want to challenge you tonight to live your life to avoid the winds uh, that God would have to do that when you're converted, when you're converted, then I want you to strengthen uh, your brethren. Why can you not strengthen your brethren before the wind? Why can you not encourage your brethren? before the wind. Why can you not be a blessing and an influence before the wind? God says, yes, when you're converted, strengthen. But I want to live my life to avoid the winds that may have to come. Why do I say that? Because this. It took a tragedy to get Peter's attention, to change his mind, and to listen to what Jesus had to tell him. It took a tragedy for Peter to change his mind, to realize that what God was saying was right. You see, Peter didn't agree with Jesus. It took a tragedy for Peter to change his mind and realize that his disagreement with Jesus was his wrong and not God's wrong. You see, all of us are much like Peter in the same way. We often never realize or think about it until, until, a tragedy or something comes to our lives that gets our attention. That's what it says in Psalm 119.67, Before, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Listen, why can't we keep the word without having the affliction? Why can't we keep the word of God without the challenges and the problems and the heartaches and the regrets in life? Why can't we live life without the wind now are converted? Because God will bring things into our lives to cause us to change our mind, to make us realize the mindset I had was a wrong mindset and God will convert you and God's encouragement and challenge is strengthen your brethren when you're converted. What's it mean? When your mind finally is changed, you'll see things from the right perspective. And at that time, I want you to strengthen the brethren. People have very few times in their lives are deciding what they believe. Once a person decides what he believes, 
He then listens to only those who he agrees with and with what he has decided to believe. And he avoids those that differ from what he has decided to believe or that are in conflict to what he believes. That's why uh, to just debate someone uh, or to try to uh, discuss something with someone, when someone has already made up their mind and they already believe what they believe, they'll only listen to that which reinforces what they believe and they'll avoid listening to anything that will contradict what they believe because they've already decided that what they believe is what they believe and it's going to be right in their eyes. We've heard it said and used a statement that the mind, uh, someone will say, my mind is made up. It's said that we learn by two things. We learn by the experiences of our life and we learn by the people that we trust. Sometimes we trust people that we shouldn't trust. Sometimes a young person won't ask their parents what to do uh, and they'll ask their peers what they should do because they feel they can trust their peers more than they can trust their parents because they trust that their peers will tell them what they want to hear that coincides with what they believe versus in hearing something and avoiding those that would differ from what they believe. Most of what we believe, we've decided to believe as a child. Those beliefs are developed and deepened uh, through the college age years of 18 to 23. What we believe controls how we behave. Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so what I believe determines the, door, the direction, the course of my life. And uh, what we believe shapes how we behave. And how we behave demonstrates what we believe. Titus 1, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, Under the pure, all things are pure. But under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind, their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Most people, listen... Most people choose a church based upon whether or not that church teaches what they already believe. They don't choose a church to help them learn what to believe. They choose a church that reinforces what they already believe. What they already have come to the conclusion they believe. Few people attend church to be changed in their thinking. Most are like Peter. Peter. And have already decided what they believe, right or wrong. And Jesus himself cannot change them or their mind concerning what they believe. Think about this. Jesus himself is admonishing Peter to have faith in him. But Peter was so convinced in his own mind that nothing could persuade him to change his mind. Not even Jesus himself. And so Jesus said, listen, let me tell you something. You're going to deny me three times. The rooster's going to crow. And when the rooster crows, it reminds you of what I've told you. That your mind was wrong. Your thoughts were wrong. Your mind was set. And nothing was going to change your mind other than a tragedy, a heartache that would come into your mind, in your life, that would cause you to realize that God was right and you were wrong. But it'll be too late then to undo the damage that Peter had already done to his disciples and to his testimony. You see, in effect, Jesus is saying this, when, the hard, when the, that hard noggin of yours gets hit hard enough, you'll begin to think about what I'm saying. The question is, is how hard your old noggin is going to have to be hit until you understand that the way you're thinking, no matter how set your thinking is, it's not right thinking. And God will bring all of us to a position, to a, a crossroad, to where when you're converted, when you're converted, when, what is it going to take for you to realize that your mindset was on a right set of mind? When you realize that you were determined to do this thing and that thing you're determined to do was not the right thing to do. And God says, when you're converted, I want to live life to avoid the winds. I want to live my life so I can encourage and strengthen and not have to live in response to the winds, to what God has to do to change my mind to see that what I was set on doing was in conflict to what God had planned and prepared for my life. You see, strengthen thy brethren and tell them that you don't have to experience heartache to believe the truth. You don't have to go through tragedy to believe that what God says is right. You can believe the truth by faith without having to experience the same and embarrassment and hurt that Peter says I had to endure. If I just would have listened... You don't have to go through the heartaches that I've gone through. 
You don't have to go through the continual reminder of that rooster crowing. It has a continual reminder that haunts me and says, yes, uh, uh, every time it crows, I hear it. I, I hear the cringe, and it cringes in my body and thinking, yes, I should have not made that choice. And, and my mind was sad, and nothing would change my mind. Even Jesus himself could not change my mind. If Jesus can't change our minds, then none of us can change the rest of our minds. It's now in our hands whether we choose to allow the word of God to change our mind or we put God in a position to where when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Because conversion will come for a child of God. It may be a year, it may be 10 years, it may be 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, but conversion will come and the mind will be changed and you'll see the heirs of your way. And that's what First Peter and Second Peter is all about. The thing that changes what we believe is a life-threatening or difficult experience like Peter faced in his life. And after Peter denied the Lord, the, cru- the rooster crowed, Peter wept bitterly, his will had been broken, his mind was changed, and he did end up dying a martyr's death for the cause of Christ. He said, I'll die for you. He did die a martyr's death. But it wasn't the direction that God had originally intended for him. Nebuchadnezzar believed what he believed. He was a man full of pride. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to build a statue so big that everyone will know how great I am. I want everybody to know what an awesome king I am. And so Nebuchadnezzar began to build this great monument uh, of self to uh, exclaim, exclaim his own greatness. And God said to him, I'm going to show you who the greatest is. It wasn't long until Nebuchadnezzar's mind was changed. Take your Bibles and go to Daniel chapter 4. and Let's see what God had to do to bring about a change in mind in this man called Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. We'll begin looking just at a couple of verses here. Daniel chapter 4. And notice what he had to endure in his life. Notice the life experiences that he had to go, go through. Notice the trials and tragedies he had to endure for his mind to be changed, for him to be converted. Daniel chapter 4. And look what it says beginning in verse number 31. Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 31. The Bible says, And while the word was in the king's mouth, He's saying, let's build a statue, and I'm awesome, and I'm great. While he was still speaking the words, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. The voice of God came. He says, and they shall drive thee from man, men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, And seven times shall pass over thee until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He says, you know what? You're going to change your mind, Nebuchadnezzar. You think it's all about you. I'm going to bring a life event in your life so you'll have a change of mind. You'll be converted and you'll know it's all about me, the Most High God. Let's read on. The Bible said in the same hour, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men. And he did eat grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, his nails like bird uh, claws. And at the end of the days, Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. And my understanding returned unto me. He said, I finally came to my senses. My mind was changed. And here's what he says. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Hey, something happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life to take this eagle, proud, driven, I'm building a statue, a monument, so everyone will know how great I am. And now we see through a life traumatic event and through a very uh, difficult trial he went through, that there he lifts up his eyes, grazing like an oxen and hair growing uh, like an eagle and claws have grown like, like an eagle's claw. And there he is, just grazing that man of pride. And there he lifts up his eyes and says, Thou, O God, are 
worthy to be praised. You're the one. Something came along. He was converted. God brought an event in his life that changed his mind. Nebuchadnezzar's mind was changed as a result. Prior to accepting God's call, Jonah fled to Nineveh, got in a boat, hoping this would get him away from God and the calling of God upon his life. Shortly after the boat left shore, a bad storm, you know, it came and started tossing the boat and the men were afraid on the ship. Jonah was the cause of this storm. In hopes of appeasing angry God, they threw Jonah overboard and Jonah is swallowed by a whale and while in the belly of a whale, he finally comes to his senses and he accepts the call of God upon his life. He had his mind made up. He had paid the fare thereof and he was going to run from God. He was going to go away from God. He had his mind made up and nothing was going to change the mind of Jonah and God allowed an event to come into his life to convert him, to change him. So his mind was changed. He realized, I can't run from God. That's my purpose. That's my calling. And Jonah there in the belly of the whale came to himself and there in that belly he restored and his mind was changed. And he says, God, I will, I will go and do what you've called me to do. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Luke 16, the rich man died, believing what he believed. The Bible says he woke up in hell with a changed mind. Look, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, the rich man died believing what he believed. He says, listen, I, I've got everything together. I, I'm going to live a long life, a prosperous life, uh, a retiring of a life. And uh, boy, just eat, drink, and be merry, and everything's going to be just fine. But notice in Luke chapter 16 and verses 23 and 24, the Bible says uh, in the verses here, the Bible says it came to pass, verse 2, that the, the beggar died and was carried the angels of Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also, that also died and was buried. Notice how. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. And he seeth Abraham afar off and lies within his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. They may dip his finger in water and cool to my, to my tongue, for I'm torment in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things. Oh, you had everything figured out. You believed what you believed. You didn't think you needed God. You thought your hey, prosperity was good enough. He said, Listen, likewise, lies with evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art torment. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gold fix. And he says, then he said in verse 27, then I said, pray thee. Therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I've got five brethren that may testify unto them that they also may come into this place of torment. He said, listen, I, I, didn't, I didn't worry about it. I believed what I believed, but I woke up in hell with a changed mind. He was burdened for souls. He was concerned about his salvation of his brethren. He had no concern of the lives of others. His well his self, his pride, that's all that matters. But he was converted. His mind was changed. Too late, but it was changed. And there in hell, he says, could you send someone to witness to my family? I don't want them to come to this place. His mind was changed, but it took a, an event. Uh, it took something uh, that to cause him to change. He believed he could live, a uh, continue living a life of wealth and prosperity, but didn't realize his days were numbered. The prodigal son thought he knew better than his father, and he wastes his inheritance because he believed different, and his mind wouldn't be changed until he found himself in a far country. The Bible says in Luke 15, and when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he says, how many hearts? servants of my father have bread enough to spare and here I perish with hunger. He went from being a rebellious son to just wanting to just come back home as a father's hired servant. It was a hog pin experience that changed his life. It was a traumatic event in his life that changed his life. Listen, when your mind is made up, nothing can change your mind except some traumatic event that comes in your life. If you continue to set your mind against God, then you're setting yourself up for conversion to take place. And you will be converted. Because God says when you're converted, when your mind's changed, strengthen your brethren. Oh, I'm glad God can use broken vessels. I'm glad God can use 
uh, those that have wasted years of their life straying away from I'm glad that God can rebuild and remake and refashion those vessels. But listen, I want to challenge us tonight. Let's live a life to avoid the winds. Let's live a life to avoid the wind. Thou art converted. Let's have a mind that's so in tune to God that it doesn't have to be changed. It doesn't have to be converted. It's already in tune with God. It's already focused with God. And God does not have to bring an event in your life that will cause you to change your mind. Guarantee, no doubts about it. Your mind will be changed. It's just what events needs to take place for the mind to be changed. That's why the Bible says you can't instruct a, or correct a fool because he's already decided what he believes. The only thing you will do is to just make him mad, telling him anything different than what he already believes. Proverbs 23, 9 says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he'll despise the wisdom of thy words. Proverbs 9, 9, Give instruction to a wise man, and he'll be wiser. Teach a just man. He'll increase in learning. But Proverbs 10, 8 says, A wise in heart receives commandment, but a prating fool shall fall. Proverbs 13, 18, Poverty and shame shall be upon him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Listen, I don't believe you have to wait until tragedy comes to your life to change your thinking and cause to believe what's right, but if you keep on the course you're on, keep believing what you're believing, then you're setting yourself up for God to do nothing other than bring an event into our lives that causes you to change your mind and says, wow, I was off on that one. I was wrong on that one. And the event changed his mind. You see, the Bible's a book of truth. At some point in time or another, you've got to decide once and for all that you're going to believe that the Bible is always right. No matter how contrary it might be to your own human reason, no matter how much it might be against your logic or what you feel or what you desire or what you want, you've got to decide once and for all that the Bible is always right. It's always right. It's always right. And that's what's going to guide you to think right because it's the mind of God. And when you think right according to the mind of God, then you don't have to have the wind. You're converted, strengthened. You can still strengthen your brethren without having to be converted. You can still be a blessing to influence others without having your mind have to be changed. You can come to the, can allow the Word of God to mold your mind and to shape your mind. I'm saying, listen, you have to stay in the Word of God to keep your mind right so that what you believe is right and in line with God's Word. We need to know the truth about what the Bible says about salvation. You gotta know what's right and not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You gotta know what the truth is that the Bible says about separation from the world. If not, you allow all the modernism of today and the compromise of today to distract you and uh, uh, put you in a position to where your mind's made up. And God says, when you're converted and realize that you were wrong, then strengthen the brethren. How do you strengthen the brethren? Don't do what I did. Listen to God. And you don't have to do what I do to be a blessed, be used of God. You can do right without having the win in your life. You see, we need to know the truth of what the Bible says about finances. We need to know the truth of what the Bible says about relationships. And by far the most important tool to renew your mind is the Word of God. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, that you may what? Uh, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind that you'll be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You'll not know the will of God unless you your mind becomes the mind of God and it's renewed in the mind of God to prove what the will of God is for your life because it's not your mind said, it's your mind in submission to the mind of God. You see, when the position of my belief is different from what the Bible says, I must choose to submit to God's word or else I put myself in a position to have to have my mind changed by some hog pen experience. That's why I try to preach so hard uh, from the Word of God. That's why I try to, because I want the Word of God uh, to be able to change our thinking. I want the Word of God to be able to get us thinking right. Because if I'm thinking right, I'll behave right, and I'll go the right direction of my life. But if I don't submit to the words of God, then I put myself in a position that my mind will need to be changed so that it submits to the will of God and the Word of God. But it'll take a hog pit experience. It'll take grazing in the field like Nebuchadnezzar. It'll take being thrown in the belly of the whale experience for Jonah. It'll take being in hell. Let the his eyes. Yes, their, their mind was changed. But look at the tragedy it took 
for their mind to be changed. Look at the event it took. For then, God says, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let me give these concluding thoughts. I'm done. Decide that the Bible is true. Decide the Bible is true. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is truth. It's not what you read on the blog. It's not what some, uh, uh, someone, some spiritual leader somewhere said. It's not what your peers have said. Truth is right here. This is truth. Thy word is truth. So number one, decide the Bible. Bible's true. Uh, listen, no matter uh, what you may think, no matter what you may feel, no matter what this Bible is on any subject, that's what we ought to hunger for. The Bible has something to say about every topic, every subject, every event, every crossroad, every decision you'll have to make. The Bible tells us exactly what is the right path, the right ro- direction to go, what is truth in the Bible. It is absolutely and dogmatically the only source of truth in the world. God says in Romans 3, 4, the spiritual pole, spiritual people of man is this. Let God be true in every man a liar. Oh, let's get back to the place of the child of God where you understand let God be true and every man a liar. Let God's word be the foundation of our truth. We should oppose any attempt to compromise or dilute biblical authority. Are you politically correct? Are you scripturally correct? Are you socially correct? Or are you all three? You can't be all three because they're mutually exclusive. You've got to be spiritually correct. That's all you can be. What does God say? Thus saith the Lord. So number one, you got to decide the Bible's true. Number two, you got to decide that the truth, that truth will be your standard for truth. You got to decide that that truth, the Bible will be your standard for truth. Whatever the Bible says, you got to measure everything by the word of God. If a scientist disagrees with the Bible, I disagree with the scientist, I agree with the Bible. If the scientist disagrees with the Bible, the Bible's right. The scientist is wrong. If a historian disagrees with the Bible, the historian's wrong. The Bible's right. If some religious uh, 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 leader uh, uh, disagrees with the Bible, then the Bible's right. And that religious leader, I don't care who he is. I don't care what following he has. I don't care how many books he's written. If it's not according to the Bible, they're wrong. And the Bible's always true. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. You see, decide that the truth is going to be your standard for truth. I like this verse. Take your Bibles. Go to Psalm 119. We're almost done. Psalm 119 in verse number 127. Psalm 119, verse number 127 and verse number 128. Oh, I love this verse here. David speaking. It says, therefore. Therefore is there for a reason. We won't take the time to read the verse, but Psalm 119 is all about the greatness of the Word of God. He said in verse 127 of Psalm 119, Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold. Do you? Do you love the Word of God more than you love that which uh, uh, fills your wallet, that which fills your coffers? Listen, it may cost you a job to be able to love God's Word more than you love gold. It may cause you to take a lesser job promotion because you love God's Word. The commandments of God more than you love God. But we've got a bunch of folks today that love God more than they love the commandments of God. They love the dollar more than they love doing right. And the standard is the job. The standard is the promotion. And the standard is not God. He says, therefore, I love thy commandments above gold. Yea, above fine gold. Therefore, he says, I esteem. I esteem. I, I set it to a level of uh, the excellence or a priority. I esteem all the pre, thy precepts concerning all things to be right. God doesn't just say, uh, David doesn't just say, most things are pretty good. Most things are practical. Most things I can apply. He says, I, I esteem. I take all the precepts of God concerning all things to be right. He says, if it's in the book, it's right. If it's in the word of God, it's right. And to violate the word and to violate with right is to set myself in a position where God has to bring something into my life to change my mind. Or I can just submit to the fact God said it, that settles it. So the preacher preaches, the counsel is given, the word of God is open, and the choice is given. Do I set my mind in conformance or submission to the mind of God? Or do I say my mind's set up? My mind's already made up. I've already decided what I'm going to do. Jesus couldn't persuade Peter to do what he told him to do, Peter says, I don't need that advice. I don't need that input. 
But Peter had his mind changed. In any of us, or any one of us, at any time of our lives when the Word of God is taught, and all things are right in the Word of God, if we choose not to submit and surrender and yield to this mind of God and make that our mindset, then we give no other option to God to say, if your mind is set and your beliefs are already set of what you believe, then I'm going to have to bring something into your life to convert you, to change your mind, so that you'll realize, as Nebuchadnezzar did, you're the, you're the mighty one. It's all about, it's not the Nebuchadnezzar image, it's all about you, God. But it took the grazing in a field, the humiliation in the field as, as an oxen, as an animal, unable to speak, unable to communicate, and God opened his understanding again after years of grazing. And when he opened his eyes of his understanding and opened his mouth so he could speak, the first words out of his mouth was, God, you're worthy of praise. I was wrong. And he says, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. I'm glad that God can use us after we make a mistake. I'm glad that God can use us irregardless of what mindset we had and the path that led us on. I'm glad God can reuse us. But I want to challenge us to live life without ever having to experience a win in your life so that God changes your mind. Number three, I said the word of God is true. Decide that. Decide that the truth for your standard will be truth of God's word. Number three, read the word of God. Read the Bible with a surrendered heart. I don't want to read the Bible to find support to what I believe. I want to read the Bible to find out how I ought to believe. I've been a student of the word long enough that I can find scriptures to support what I want to do though I'm taking the scripture out of context. I can find verses that can support me doing what I want to do and support it. It's not in conformance to what God says, but I'm taking it out of context. I don't want to read the Bible to find something that supports why I'm, what I'm wanting to do is right. I want to be able to put myself and read the Bible to find out how I ought to believe. What ought to be my mindset? What ought to be my way of thinking in this situation? Because whatever God says... That's what I want to believe. Because what I believe determines how I behave. What I believe determines how I behave. And once I've decided what I believe, there's only one of two options that you have. You'll allow the Word of God to change your beliefs through the preaching of the Word of God, through your personal Bible study, through a submissiveness and surrendered as you allow the Word of God to change your thinking or when you know what the Word of God says and you still continue to do your mindset, your decision, because it's set, then you put yourself in a position to where God says, okay, Satan has desired to have you. And so therefore, because you're not listening to what I'm saying, when thou art converted, when your mind's changed, I want you to strengthen your brother. Hear the word of God with a surrendered heart and then also read the word of God with a surrendered heart and then hear the word of God with a surrendered heart through the preaching of the word of God. People need guidance from God. And how they should make up their minds on difficult situations, God gives them the Bible. In the Old Testament alone, there's over 413 times that the phrase, thus saith the Lord is uttered. Why? Because God said, I want you to know what my opinion is. I want you to know what my thoughts are. I want you to know what, how I think about this. Thus saith the Lord. If that doesn't concern you, what God says about a topic or a situation or, or some circumstance, then God says, that's fine. You have a free will and Satan desires to have you. So when you're converted, because you're going to find out that God is always right. You're going to find that out. You're going to find out that God's word is always true. You're going to eventually find that out. No matter how proud or resistant we might be, God says, you're going to be converted. Why? He says, when you're converted, strengthen 
your brethren. Why would the Old Testament prophets speak, thus saith the Lord? Because it showed that they had ultimate authority to speak God's word. It was based on the fact that God has spoken to them and given them the authority to relay to the people what they needed to hear. That's why the Old Testament prophets could preface the message of God who gave them and say, Thus saith the Lord. Let's go back to our story in Luke chapter 22, and I just want to end on this. Tonight, like these 12, the Lord's Supper had been done hours before the crucifixion. Satan pulls Peter aside and said, Simon, Satan's desired to have you. He's out to get you. How does he get us? Our faith, our trust. Our trust to do what God says. Our trust to follow God's word. The trust to do the right thing. But Jesus says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And then he says, and when, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Can God use us after we mess up? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're all a testimony of that, aren't we? Absolutely. Can God use us to make an impact for the cause of Christ? Absolutely. No doubt about it doubt about it. That's God. That's the awesomeness and wonder of God. It's amazing. We're all, we're, we're a walking testimony, a testament of that. We are a testimony of that. That's us. But why would we put God in a position because of our unwillingness to submit and yield to the words of God And the mind of God, of what God says we should be doing, and we choose with a mindset of saying, my mind's already made up. I already made up my mind. There's nothing you can do to change my mind. We realize that. God realized that. But God has a way of changing everyone's mind. You've got family members. You're wondering what it's going to take. You've tried everything to change your mind. Nothing's working. Nothing's budging. Nothing's changing nothing. Jesus couldn't change the mind of Peter. Who are we to think we could change anybody's mind? The only hope is is that the individual would have some understanding that this word is truth. And everything within this truth is going to be the standard by which I live my life. Because if I stay in this word and follow this direction, then my mindset is set on his mind and not on my mind. If I choose, and in those areas I choose not to surrender and submit to God's word, then God says, okay, now we enter another arena. When? When your mind's changed, I want you to tell others, don't go to the, down the path that you went down. Don't make the choices that you made. Don't be hard-headed like you were. Don't be so resistant as you were. You can still influence and strengthen the lives of others without having a life event come into your life that God has to get your attention so that your mind is finally changed. And these are just a few of the examples. We could go all the way through the Bible And look at multiple examples of those that had their mind made up. And they were not willing to submit to the mind of God. And God said, okay, I'm going to change your mind. Peter's mind was changed. But the cost that he had to pay was pretty hard. Jonah's mind was changed. But the cost he paid was pretty rough. Nebuchadnezzar, his mind was changed. But what a humiliation he had to go through for his mind to be changed. As we look at the story of the rich man, he was planning to build his barns and bigger and better, and boy, this is going to be a great life. I can retire early. And God said, this night, thy soul am I required of thee. 
And in hell, his mind was changed. And he says, could you please send someone to tell my brothers to not have to come to this place? Could you please tell them? Please. His mind was changed. Each of us can look back at times in our lives and the reason we were at a place where we got saved is because there was some life event that got our attention. We were at the end of life's road, the end of the rope, and at that life of time of crisis, we said, we might as well give God a try. We've tried everything else. And we reached out to God, and God says, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. But do you really want to put yourself and your God in a position to where there's a win? You're converted. Because your mind will be changed whenever it's in conflict to the word of God. It will be. Because God says it will be. And the more resistant, the more defiant that we are against God's word, the more God will have to tighten the reins in our lives to change our mind. I can't change your mind through the message tonight. You can't change my mind. God's word can maybe change someone's mind if you submit to it. Or you can keep going the path you're going whether here or listening to the live stream. And you keep going down that path, and God says your mind will be changed. So you're going to leave. you got a, you got a, a loved one not serving God. you got a husband or a wife, child, brother, sister. Tell them you're praying for. We all do. The Word of God can change their mind. But if they don't submit to the Word of God, their mind will be changed. But it'll be some event, some experience, life experience that they'll go through. And their eyes will be open and will say, you are right. God, you are true. I was wrong. The damage has been done. The years have been wasted. The opportunities are no longer there. God can use me again. Yes. I can be an influence again. Praise the Lord. But the wind has left a life scar. And every time the rooster crows throughout the rest of Peter's life, it was a constant reminder that I did what I wanted to do and I didn't do what God wanted to do. My mind was made up. And the rooster crowed for years and years. He preached Pentecost, and I, but every time he heard the rooster, it was a continual reminder. I did it your way. You didn't listen to Jesus. Father, tonight, my prayer for all of us is that we would see the seriousness of the hour. Lord, we want the Bible to make a difference in our thinking. We want to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. As the word of God renews our mind and tells us how and what we ought to think upon. Lord, there may be some areas of each of our lives to where we're not doing what we know your word says. And our mind's made up. We're not changing. The question is not, your mind won't be changed. The question is whether or not you allow the word of God to change your mind or whether God will have to bring an event into your life to change your mind. But your mind will be changed because you cannot and will not go against God's word and not have a change of mind. Not realize that God is always right. And God always has my best interest at heart at all times. Father, speak to my heart. Help me to walk humbly as I spend time with you in the word. Help each of us, Lord, as a church member, as a Christian, to walk humbly as we walk with you. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. Let's stand. You've got family members.
got people you're praying for, unsaved or saved, it doesn't matter. You're praying for them. You're praying for them. Their mind's just set. Nothing's changing their mind. If Jesus could not change the mind of Peter, what makes us think that we have leverage to change someone's mind? We cannot. It's beyond our ability. So our prayer is that we as Christians will be submissive to the words of God. Not the ones we like to obey, the ones we feel comfortable obeying. But where David said, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. All of God's word is right. If you don't believe that, you'll be converted. Seven of the nine times it talked about salvation. Two of those nine times it talks about a change of mind. Change of mind. The roosters will crow. The hog pen experience will take place. No doubt about it. It will take place. It'll happen. The Nebuchadnezzar grazing in the field. It will come to pass. It will. Oh, we owe it to our wives, fellas. Let's have the mind of Christ. We owe it to our children, his parents. Let's make sure we're doing the right things. As a Christian, we owe it to our church family. We've got to do the right thing. We've got to do the right thing. Those that look to us as an example, a role model, we've got to do the right thing. Tonight, living life to avoid the wind. To avoid the wind. I can go back to several times in my life and tell you my mind was changed. My mind was changed. Sometimes it was because of my submission to the Word of God, but other times it was because of some events. Some whale experiences. Some hog pen times. In hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. All of a sudden, he got burdened for souls, but he had no burden before. His mind was changed, though. God will change our minds. It's just what's it going to take for God to get your attention? That's the question. What's it going to take? No one can answer that but you. God can't even persuade you to do what is right when your mind's made up. Heavenly Father, tonight, we ask you to take this truth, burn it deep within our hearts, that it will be a, a message of deterrence, they will not look back with regret because of a message we heard that we failed to submit to, but it'll be a message of salvaging that we can look back to that spared us from much heartache and disappointment. And you may never know this side of glory what the heartache is that you were spared. You may never know this side of heaven what that hog experience that you did not have to go through was as you submit to the word of God. But if you choose not to submit, you'll know firsthand. You'll be able to testify to your brethren what that hog experience was. And you'll be able to wave the flag and say, you don't have to do what I did to make a difference and influence on people's lives. You can avoid the wind you're converted. Thank you, Father. Give us a blessed rest of the night. 
And uh, bless week. Bring us back Wednesday for another great service together. Protect us. Those tonight at home, give them safety, health, uh, recovery. And uh, Lord, I pray you give revival to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank